reminder of communion on Christmas Eve morning this coming Sunday, as well as uh, just a reminder on the Israel trip and the Bible Museum trip. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and not faint. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall defend your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. For the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. <clears throat> Before we get started, Uh, This evening, we'll make sure that we're in right relationship with the Lord, ready to uh, study His Word. I hope that you have spent the day enjoying fellowship with God, reading your Bible some this morning, and focusing on spiritual realities in the midst of this busy, uh, commercialized Christmas season. But uh, now we'll focus on the Lord and study His Word tonight. So after a few moments of silent prayer, then I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, we're indeed grateful that we can come together this evening to study your word, to focus on the truth of your word, to be encouraged and strengthened spiritually. Father, we continue to pray for those in this congregation who are facing extremely difficult medical situations and challenges. Some have uh, diseases that will may be life-threatening, and they may be near their transition. Father, we pray for them and those taking care of them and those who are uh, watching over them, that they might be a a faithful witness to those around them and that they might be an encouragement uh, as well from your word. Thank you for the opportunity to study your word this evening, and we pray that you would uh, just enable us to understand the significance of this great passage. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right, open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3, and we'll pick up in verse 18 to give us a context and understand some of the things that are going on here. This is a very important passage, and we've taken some time to set the background and set the stage so that we can truly understand what is going on in this particular passage. And I think it's important at the outset to take a look at uh, the structure, again, of this passage. It just hits me more and more as I do Bible study how important it is to keep our focus on the context. And the context of First Peter is that Peter is encouraging his readers to stand fast in the midst of suffering. And again and again, he's faced different life situations whether it has to do with unjust authorities, unjust masters, unjust situations, to always live our life with a clean conscience. That comes back in this particular passage we'll hit tonight. But what he means by that is doing the right thing the right way in whatever situation we find ourselves in, no matter what no matter how bad it may be, no matter uh, what the suffering, the adversity may be, but doing the right thing, and that means that we are living our life uh, before the Lord with with a clean conscience, and that means it has we're walking with the Lord, <clears throat> and we're having a a uh, positive spiritual growth in the midst of testing, in the midst of adversity. So we talked about the importance of that and suffering. For righteousness' sake, look back at verse 14, chapter 3, verse 14. But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, if that is God's plan, then you're blessed. 
this accrues to spiritual growth opportunities to uh, follow God's plan for your life, to apply the scripture opportunities to grow and see God's grace in your life. And then we're minded, do not be afraid of their threats, nor troubled. And that is a quote that comes out of the Old Testament and reminds us of the fact that, that God does have a plan, and even if that includes us suffering to the point of death, God is still going to uh, provide for us. He is still going to protect us. And then from that, he goes on to say, but sanctify or set apart the Lord God in your hearts, always being ready to give an answer to everyone who asks a reason for the hope that is in you so that you become a verbal testimony as a result of your nonverbal testimony in the midst of adversity, in the midst of opposition, and in their case, in the midst of suffering and persecution because they're, they're Christians. And then notice verse 16, having a good conscience, or because you have a good conscience. Why do you have a good conscience? That means that you have done what you're supposed to do. You have responded the way you're supposed to respond. You've reacted the way you should react. You haven't operated on your sin nature. You haven't reacted in anger or depression or fear or anxiety. You have stood in the grace of the Lord. And so you have a good conscience that those who defame you as evildoers, that is, those who are making these claims, these false accusations against you, that they, um, and they revile your good conduct in Christ, that they might be ashamed. That doesn't mean they always will be, but sometimes they will. And then the conclusion in verse 17 is, for it is better if it is the will of God to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. That sets up the context for verses uh, 18 down through tw uh, 22. Now notice the illustration, the explanation of this command in verse, in verse 18 is for Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust. So G God is not expecting us to respond to unjust uh, criticism, unjust persecution, unjust uh, situations in a way that is that Christ didn't already go through to a much, much uh, higher degree. Now, that's the explanation. It starts off with the phrase in the Greek, because, so they're explaining that. And then we have this section from 18 to 22, and then it comes back at 4.1, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same a mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Now, that clearly tells us that the context is he's talking to believers. He's not talking to unbelievers. So he's not going to be talking about how to get to heaven when you die. He's talking about how to live today in a way that will accrue to spiritual growth and eventually spiritual maturity so that it, as you apply the word, you will, you will grow following the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the context here is going to be what? Phase one, getting into heaven. Phase two, being saved from the power of sin. Or phase three, glorification, being face to face with the Lord. The context is clearly talking about the spiritual life, phase two how we grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so everything that is talked about here, especially when we get into those key words in verse uh, 21, is talking about, uses the word baptism, and it talks about the word uh, being, being saved, uh, <clears throat> which is mentioned in verse, uh, verse 20. And also the idea uh, pervades verse, uh, verse 21 of salvation, that this is going to be phase two or our spiritual growth as opposed to justification or glorification. So what we've done is we stopped 
for a topical study to understand the background to verse 19. Christ suffers for sins. That's his death on the cross, where he suffers the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, the doctrine of reconciliation. Having been put to death in the flesh, that is physical death on the cross, but, and then we read, made alive by the Spirit. Now, we'll talk about that again in just a minute, but then it goes on to say, by whom, that's the New King James translation, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. So we're going to go through this, and now that we've spent a lot of time setting this up, we can go through it fairly rapidly to hit the high point. So we talked about the angelic rebellion. We talked about a key part of this in Satan's attacks on the human race. The first major attack was in the Garden of Eden, tempting Adam and Eve to disobey God, starting with Eve and then Adam, and that resulted in the fall. But God had a great solution. That great solution is going to come through the seed of the woman. The seed of the woman is talking about physical uh, generation from the woman, that the Savior, the solution to the problem, God's redemption solution, is going to come through a human being. It's not going to come through an angel. It's not going to go, come through God himself as simply divine, himself as divine alone. It's going to come through a special descendant of of Eve. Now we learn later on that this descendant is going to be the incarnation of God, but he will be true humanity as well as undiminished deity. And a lot of people ask the question, well, why did God have to become a man? And at Christmas time, of course, that's the focal point, and it's a very important question. You know, maybe you can ask your kids that question uh, at, at Christmas to get them to think about it. What why did God become a man? Why was it necessary? Because God, a man had to die for men. A human being had to die in the place of other human beings. God could not die as a substitute. An angel couldn't die as a substitute. It had to be a human being. So this is, becomes evident in Genesis 3.15, and Satan has a plan to disrupt that. And that plan is first mentioned in Genesis chapter 6, verse 2. The context comes after chapter 5, which gives a list of genealogy. The descendants of Adam going down through uh, <clears throat> the great-grandfather of Noah, which is Methuselah. And interestingly enough, Methuselah lives the longest life of anyone uh, in the Bible, and he dies just the year before the flood comes. And his name has the idea of, of uh, peace until he dies. That idea that there will be a postponed judgment until he dies. He dies uh, earlier in the year, the year that the flood came. But the reason for the flood is stated that to be the evil that is multiplying upon the earth, and this is alluded to in and, and in Genesis 6 2, that the sons of God, and we saw that this is always a term that refers to angels. It doesn't distinguish them in terms of elect angels or fallen angels. You have to get that from context. It's used in Job chapter 1, Job chapter 2, to refer to all of the angels without discrimination between the good and the evil angels. But here it refers to a group that is going to leave their uh, primary dwelling place in heaven, and they are going to commit a sexual sin. Now, we don't get that so much from this passage as we do from uh, Jude 6 and 7 and 2 Peter uh, chapter 2, verse 5. So here we learn that the sons of God, who are fallen angels, see the daughters of men. So it is looking at a sexual relationship between the angels. How that happened, we can't say specifically, but the angels had the ability to transform their immaterial bodies into physical bodies and to take on physical properties. So in, they were able to do this, and this would uh, dilute the and change the DNA of the human, human race, the genetics, so that their offspring would not be 
100% human. It would be a perversion. So this was an attack on the seed of the woman. Now, what's interesting is if you read Genesis, there is a constant repetition of this concept of the seed, the descendants. Uh, Isaac will be the promised seed or the promised descendant of Abraham. And so the purpose for all those genealogies is to trace the fulfillment of God's promise from generation to generation all the way through uh, Genesis. And then at the end we know and we've learned that not only is it going to be a descendant of Adam and Eve, but also a descendant of Shem, a descendant of Abraham, a descendant of Isaac and Jacob and uh, Joseph and come from the tribe of Judah by Genesis chapter uh, 49. We know all of this. We've learned and narrowed it down so that this is the line of of the Messiah. So it's stated in Genesis 1, 6. We went through this last week. The New Testament gives us clarification. I've always been surprised by those who did not take the that the sons of God were angels. There are some who do that. I had a couple of professors in seminary that took that position. I mentioned last week there's a third position that's even a greater minority position. And I've often wondered, and I have not received satisfactory answers, what they do with these passages in Jude 6 and 7 and 2 Peter 2, 4 and 5. So here we're told that there's this subset of angels who don't stay in their original domain. They leave it. Somehow they are able to change things. They abandon that proper abode, and they are now punished. They are kept in eternal bonds under darkness for a future judgment. The comparison to the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah in Jude 7 tells us it's a sexual sin. 2 Peter 2.4 talks about a group of angels that sinned. They're cast into Tartarus and committed to pits of darkness. So that's the same idea as you have in Jude 6 with the chains of darkness reserved for judgment. And then verse 5 says, or links this to the time of Noah. So all of this pulls together in the scripture. So what we have in 1 Peter 3.18 is after talking about Jesus' physical death and then the resurrection, summarizing that in these two almost stock phrases in Scripture talking about his death and his resurrection, then you come to the next verse, which begins somewhat awkwardly as we look at uh, the first uh, verse in 1 Peter, the first uh, phrase in 1 Peter 3.19, in which... Now, that's odd, odd phrasing in English, because we think that this goes back to spirit. And this, notice in this English translation I took here, it's got a lowercase s. This should be an uppercase s, that it's by the God, the Holy Spirit, that the power of the Spirit, that Christ is raised from the dead. And so we would expect, and we do find in the New King James Version, that it translates 319 in whom... And so that is taking this relative uh, particle, this relative pronoun that is there in the Greek and is relating it to spirit. And that makes sense. That's the most popular view. And that makes sense because it's a, a neuter relative pronoun. So in Greek, you have relative pronouns that can be masculine, feminine, or neuter, and that tells you something about the noun they're referring to, which since it comes earlier is called the antecedent, okay? That's the technical grammatical term. So what's the antecedent to, to the relative pronoun here? Well, it looks that it would also like be a, it's neuter, so the noun it refers to would also be neuter, that would be spirit. But that creates some other grammatical um, problems. And uh, there's a lot of discussion in the commentaries, a lot of confusion because the grammar here seems to be somewhat difficult. And I did a lot, I've done a lot of digging, and I have typically gone along with the most popular, the most common uh, translation here is the translation that you have in the New King James, in whom taking that to refer to uh, the Holy Spirit. However, uh, there are a few commentators who 
differ on this. I think they've got a point, although they, one of the other problems you have is that they come along and they try to take spirit here as Christ spiritually. They're, they're, it's not like they're way off the paper, but they're not in the bullseye. And what they will argue is that this is talking about after his physical death, but before the physical resurrection, he's made alive spiritually. And so spiritually, without a physical body, he, which makes sense, he goes to preach to these spirits in prison. Now, that makes sense except for one thing, and that is context once again because you have this idea of being made alive by means of the spirit which looks like it would be resurrection and in reading through about five of these commentaries today what happens is somewhere as they are in this um, discussion they slide from talking about being made alive in the spirit to to his resurrection without explaining how they got physical bodily resurrection into that last phrase. Now, I have problems with things like that. This is where you get down into the real granular details of, uh, of exegesis. But what happens is, if you look at your text down in verse uh, verse. 21, we, the final phrase is, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then when you get down even further into the next chapter, it talks about the, the idea of resurrection. So the best way to understand this is you've got this almost stock phrase, he's put to death in the flesh, made alive by the Spirit. That refers to his physical body resurrection. And then when it says in which, that relative pronoun, it's, it's a neuter, but it doesn't refer back to the neuter noun. You have something similar in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that. What does the that refer to? Does it refer to the faith? No, because it's a neuter and it doesn't refer to faith. It's a feminine noun. You've been saved by grace. Ah, same problem. You've got a, uh, a, a different noun. You've got, a, uh, you know, you've got a masculine noun. And the neuter particle for that doesn't, the relative pronoun there doesn't go back to kairos. So our <clears throat> chirates are feminine, I believe. Um, so what do you do? Well, if you've got a multiple terms that you're referring to in the Greek, then the relative pronoun you use is going to be in the neuter because it's not referring to one specific. Now, even if one of them happens to be in the neuter, it's still referring to the, the whole thing. And so it is uh, the... The dative case for the, for the relative pronoun also indicates time. Now, in a couple of these commentators, I mentioned Henry Alford, for one, who's at the turn of the 20th century, and also uh, 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 Selwyn, Peter Selwyn, who's got a classic, excellent commentary on the Greek text of 1 Peter. I mean, excuse me, Edwin Selwyn come up with the right understanding even though they blow it on spirit, I believe, they get it right here on the relative. It's during which, during which, it's talked about a framework of time from the crucifixion to the resurrection, and then says during which time he went and made proclamation to the spirits. Now, that's how we all have understood this, but it solves the problem when you get into uh, understanding the Greek. And so you can make a note in your Bible to translate this during which, that is during this time from the crucifixion to the resurrection, during which time he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison. So that's the verse that we're talking about. We've identified these spirits in prison as these, this subset of the sons of God who intermarried and took wives, had sexual relations with uh, human uh, women, and produced this offspring, this operation that was designed to destroy the genetic purity of the human race. 
So they are in prison, just a generic term for in, being in prison. They're sent directly to jail, uh, do not pass go, do not go, collect $200, and they don't get a j- get out of jail free card. So this is talking about Sheol. Now, the best description of Sheol comes out of the story. Some people want to call it a, a parable, uh, and it's not a parable because a parables do not use proper names referring to specific individuals. And you have the story of Lazarus and the rich man. Lazarus is a homeless beggar begging for food outside the gates of the home of the the rich man. And Lazarus dies. And when Lazarus died, he goes to Abraham's bosom. This is also called paradise in other passages. This is where Old Testament believers go. So Lazarus is an Old Testament believer, and <clears throat> and he. This is where Old Testament believers went. Now, paradise doesn't exist as a compartment of Sheol anymore. After the crucifixion, then paradise moved to the third heaven, and that's according to Second Corinthians twelve one through four where Paul is taken up to the third heaven to paradise. So paradise then has transferred all of the Old Testament believers in their interim body were taken to heaven by the Lord Jesus Christ after, uh, after the crucifixion, after the resurrection. That's part of his uh, vic- taking a victory lap because of what was accomplished on the cross. We're also told that there is something that the Bible describes as a great fixed gulf or an impassable, impermeable barrier that exists between Abraham's bosom and a place on the other side that's uh, comprised of fiery torments. And this is where the rich man went when he died. And this is a place where all unbelievers from all dispensations go. This is a holding cell. This is going to jail before you go to your final execution and your final judgment. So this is what happened. And we're told in Luke 16, 19 to 25, that the rich man is begging Abraham. So he is able to see across the uh, impassable barrier, and he's begging Abraham to let Lazarus dip his hand in this gulf, in this water, and to touch it to his tongue so that he can have relief from the burning uh, torments, but he can't do that. And so that's one compartment, but then there's another compartment called Tartarus, and Tartarus is the place where these demons are chained. Okay, so that is where they're permanently imprisoned until they are brought to a future judgment. This is this very much shows that God has permanently uh, judged those rebellious sons of God in Genesis 6. That's why I don't believe that anything like that was allowed to continue because there is a very definite and harsh punishment. For those angels, they are imprisoned throughout all of history until they are uh, they are judged. So this is the Genesis six uh, fallen angels. So that now, after the cross, all we have is an empty space over here because paradise has been moved to heaven, according to Second Corinthians twelve four and Revelation two seven, and all that is left is torments, where all unbelievers from all the dispensations go. And then Tartarus, which is the uh, chains of darkness. So Jesus is making a proclamation. The word is sometimes translated preach. It's the word uh, keruzo, but it doesn't mean to preach in the modern sense of what goes on in a church. It has the idea of making a proclamation. And so Jesus goes there to proclaim the fact that sin has been dealt with. He's had victory over death and that he has won the strategic victory in the angelic conflict. He has defeated Satan, and he has defeated the angels, but that doesn't mean it's over with yet. It's not going to, they're not going to be judged again for at least 2,000, 3,000 years, because it's after the millennial kingdom, 
And so God is still working out his purposes uh, during this time. Now, these angels are then described in 1 Peter 3.20. And in 1 Peter 3.20, we read that they, were for, they, they are identified as those who were formerly disobedient. So again, that fits with the 2 Peter 2, 4, and 5, and with Jude 6 and 7, that this is a group of spirits who previously were disobedient, and it is identified in time with uh, God's patience. Remember, God warned uh, Noah that he would judge the earth. He told, gave Noah instructions on building the ark, and 120 years went by. That is this period of divine patience or long suffering in the days of Noah. So we've seen this that in first uh, second Peter 2 4 and 5 it's connected to the days of Noah. This is connected to the days of Noah here. It's connected to the days of Noah in of course the original context of Genesis 6 3 and it is an event that it though it isn't stated as being at the time of Noah in Jude 6 and 7 the sin in Jude 6 predates the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah in verse 7. So it ha what, ha what is referred to there in Jude 6 must precede Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, Sodom and Gomorrah is in Genesis 19, and the sin of these angels is in Je uh, Genesis chapter 6. So it clearly precedes the sin of, of, uh, of Sodom and Gomorrah. <clears throat> So the, it's identified as being at the time of Noah. And then it's this period of long suffering is while the ark was being prepared. So it's during that 120 year period. Now this is important because it shows that when you compare this with 2 Peter 2, 5, Noah was a preacher of righteousness. And that's the key term to use in the Old Testament when you're talking about how does a person get saved. It's tracing this idea of righteousness. Isaiah 64, 6, all our works of righteousness are as filthy rags. So how is a person uh, how does a person become righteous in the Old Testament? Is it by following the law? No. It is by trusting in the salvation promise of Abraham. Abraham believed God, Genesis 15, 6, and it was credited to him as righteousness. That verse is then quoted by Paul in Romans chapter 4 to show that throughout all of history, all dispensations, justification before God, that is being made righteous or declared righteous, actually not made righteous, but declared righteous, is the result of of faith in God's promise and be receiving the imputation of righteousness to those who trust in him. So during this 120 years, people are hearing the gospel. People are listening to it. They are given information, but they suppress it in unrighteousness. And they, therefore, they are, uh, they are not ready for the judgment that's coming. This is what is described in Matthew chapter 24. There are those who take Matthew 24, uh, 37 to 42, as talking about the rapture. I just gave a paper on this at the pre-trib conference uh, last week, uh, and I taught this about a year ago in Matthew, that this is not talking about, um, this is not talking about the rapture. It's, there's a comparison that is being made. That's seen in Matthew 24, 37. But as the days of Noah were, so there's the comparison. Just There's a comparison between what happens at the end of the tribulation to what happened at the end of that first uh, dispensation, uh, the, our age, the age of the Gentiles at the conclusion of the dispensation of human conscience. But but it's not talking about the rapture. There's certainly similarities, but similarities don't mean identity. It just means that there are similar. It's the differences that are important. And the entire context of Matthew 24, verses 4 to 30, 
uh, 5 is really talking about the coming of Jesus at the second coming when he comes in the clouds to establish his kingdom. And that's what's referred to in verse 36 of that day and hour. That refers to something in the immediate context. The only thing it could refer to is that day and hour of the Son of Man coming in the clouds in verse 30. And it says that that day and hour, no one knows. People say, well, uh, you ought to be able to figure it out. You go into... um, you go into Daniel, you're able to realize that Daniel's 70th week is a seven-year period. Once you start seeing the uh, events and the judgments of the tribulation take place, you see the Antichrist sign a treaty with Israel, you can count down the days. Yes, th- of course you can. But when Jesus spoke, when Jesus spoke in verse 36, and he said, of that day and hour no one knows, Jesus is talking about at his time when he is speaking, because he doesn't know the day or the hour. Now, Jesus Christ was in hypostatic union at that time in the incarnation. Now, we've all studied this. In the incarnation, he is undiminished deity and true humanity. In his deity, he's omniscient. He knows all things. But under the doctrine of kenosis, that is poorly translated in Philippians Uh, 2, 5 through 7, where it talks about he emptied himself and took on the form of a servant. Well, if that's correctly translated, the way he is, he he empties himself by, by not giving up anything, but by taking or adding on the form of a servant. And what is happening is he's, he's willingly limiting the exercise of his divine prerogatives, his divine omniscience, his divine omnipotence, and his divine omnipresence. He's restricting the use of his omniscience to fulfill the mission of salvation at the incarnation. So in his incarnation, up to the point of the resurrection, he doesn't know the day or the hour because that's not given to him to know during that time when he is on the earth. But he's going to die. He's going to be raised from the dead. Forty years later, he's going to ascend to heaven and sit at the right hand of God the Father. When he's there, that restriction of those divine attributes no longer applies. He is glorified in heaven as the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Father, and he knows at that point, he knows exactly when the uh, second coming is going to be. Now, the reason I do that is because I'm showing that here's one example of a situation where when Jesus says, no one knows the day of the hour, not, not, but only the Father, not even the angels in heaven, that changes with the ascension so that he knows. Well, what else changes later on? Well, later on in time, there's going to be the rapture, and the rapture is, rapture is followed at some point by the signing of the peace treaty in Daniel, mentioned in Daniel 9, uh, 25 and following the peace treaty between the prince who is to come and Israel. Now, once that happens, anyone who's living there is going to be able to count down to the second coming. They're going to, but we don't know when the rapture is going to occur. Therefore, we don't know when that's going to begin. But once the rapture occurs and the uh, 70th week of Daniel uh, occurs, then you can watch. But you can't watch for the second coming until you get into the countdown. Then you can start watching. And that's the point of this. If you look down there in verse 42, Talking to that generation, Jesus says, Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. It's indeterminate in the future. So back in verse 38, there's the comparison. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. Now what happens is you'll hear people say, see, everything's continuing as normal. Normal activities. They get married, they eat, they drink, they grocery shop, they cook their meals, they go to work. Everything's normal. If you study what's going on in the uh, 
uh, tribulation period, nothing is normal. You've got the seal judgments and the trumpet judgments. You've got a third of the a quarter of the earth, and then a third of the earth is killed. It's anything but normal. How can how can you uh, have this talking about the second coming? It's got to be talking about the rapture because this is talking about just normal living. The problem with that is that they just assume that's the meaning of the analogy. They don't look at the text to see what the text says the point of the analogy is. The point of the analogy isn't normal living. The point of the analogy is those who were alive during that 120-year period before the flood weren't prepared. They weren't watching. They rejected Noah's message. They denied the truth of it. They're living in a fantasy world just like every unbeliever does who's suppressing the truth in unrighteousness. So that's the comparison, is they're living as if they're not, there's not a judgment impending, and they've denied it. So they're going to be caught completely off guard, completely surprised by the judgment that comes. When verse 39 says they didn't know until the flood came, well, it's not because they weren't given the information. Noah gave it to him. He was a preacher of righteousness. He preached for 120 years. They watched him build the ark. This is a huge thing that, that he's building. It's enormous. Modern ships did not, uh, were not larger than that until the 1850s. <clears throat> and so that was a testimony to the coming judgment. But they denied it. They rejected it. And so when the flood came and took them all away, took, took those who were denying it, those who were uh, the unbelievers took them away in judgment. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. When he comes, there are those who are unbelievers who are going to be taken away in judgment. Two will be, then two men will be left in the field, and one will be taken and the other left. Now there's a word change here from um, those who were taken away in verse 39 to those taken in verse 40, and you'll find people who believe the raptures here say, see, that word change is important. The word that's used here always means uh, to be taken in, in, a, in a positive sense. But it's used of the devil taking Jesus into the wilderness in order to be tempted. It's taken of Jesus being taken to the Roman soldiers. And those aren't good contexts. So that's just a misrepresentation of what the word means. It just means to be taken somewhere. Sometimes it's a good context. Sometimes it's a bad context. But the word doesn't necessarily mean only one or the other. So you have two uh, men in the field, one is taken, taken in judgment, the other is left behind. It's interesting, the word there for left is the Greek word aphiemi, which uh, <clears throat> probably just means nothing more than left here, but it also, aphiemi is the word for forgiveness. And I think it's possible to translate this, the one that's left is the other's forgiven. The one who remains is a forgiven individual because he trusted in the gospel during the tribulation period. And so the warning that is coming then in verse 42 is to watch. So that's what's going on here. Back to 1 Peter. Uh, this is the uh, same analogy going on here is that the, those who were in the ark were those who were uh, protected. And those who were outside of the ark are the ones who died. The ones in the ark are dry. The ones outside the ark are wet. The reason I make that point is because a passage uses the word baptism, and when most people hear the word baptism, they immediately think about water baptism. But there are eight different kinds of baptism in the Bible, and this is one of them. So in verse, um, here we have an important phrase at the end before I get to talking about baptism. These spirits were formerly disobedient during this time of divine patience while the ark is being prepared, and it was in that ark that eight souls are saved through water. Now, this isn't the Greek word sozo here. It's a different word, but it has the same idea. They're rescued. That's the idea, rescued through water. What's important is this phrase, through water. 
because there's a parallelism that is set up in this text that is critical for understanding what it means. And that's in the next verse, in verse 21. There's a lot of words in verse 21 before you get to the final phrase. But notice, the final phrase is through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So what I want to, I, I want to talk about each element of verse 20, 21, but I have to do it. We're going to start with the back, with the end, and work backwards. So what we have here is a comparison between two situations. A situation where you have eight believers who are saved through or by means of, of water, through the water, that is the flood waters. They are saved through them. Then you have <clears throat> those who now are saved. See where it says there's an antitype which now saves us. That's sozo. So this isn't talking about phase one, getting into heaven. It's not talking about being baptized to get saved. It is talking about their deliverance from or our deliverance from suffering. That's the whole topic in 1 Peter is how the believer can live for the Lord with a good conscience, not giving in to sin nature control under adversity in order to grow spiritually. Phase two, putting to death the deeds of the flesh or uh, realizing that we're saved from the power of sin today. So this is the parallel in this analogy between the two. Now, the next word that we need to talk about is this word, antitype. That's a word everybody here has used at least three times today, right? Not even three times in the last year. So this is always a little bit difficult for people because normally we talk about a type in the scripture. That's an old English word. For, uh, <clears throat> it's really a cognate of the Greek word tupas, which means an example. Okay, so we have an example. So I made this little chart here to help us understand this. On the left side, we have some examples of biblical types or biblical examples foreshadowing of what is going to be accomplished or fulfilled by the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have a foreshadowing person. Aaron, as a high priest, is foreshadowing Christ as our high priest. That's a person. Uh, an event. Uh, an event would be something on the order of a sacrifice, okay? Christ is going to be our sacrifice. Or a thing, like a lamb, a lamb without spot or blemish is a picture, a foreshadowing of the sinless Lord Jesus, the Lamb of God who will take away the sin of the world. So you see the Lamb is the type, and Jesus is the antitype. He's the eternal truth that is being pictured by the type. David is a type. He is anointed, Mashiach in the Hebrew. David is anointed as the uh, messianic king, uh, the human messianic king of Israel in the Old Testament, but he is a, merely a picture of the ultimate reality, who is Jesus, who is the Mashiach, the ultimate Mashiach, the eternal king who will rule over Israel as the son of David. So David is a type. Jesus is the what's being pictured. He's the antitype. Now, all we have here in verse 21 is the phrase, there's an antitype. Wait a minute, it doesn't mention the type. Well, if you have an antitype, which is the baptism that now saves us, what's the antitype? The antitype is an identification with Noah indicating that this is a baptism. These people are baptized with Noah. Now, <clears throat> we have to understand this. So this is verse 30, uh, uh, chapter 3, verse 21. There is also an antitype, which now saves us, baptism, but not physical watery removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. Now, we have to take some time to understand this. What is the meaning of baptism? 
The Greek word bapto, the verb, means to dip <clears throat> or plunge or immerse. And that is what we normally think of in baptism. You take a believer in believer's baptism and you immerse them in water. And it's a picture of them being identified in the death that's being plunged into the water and the burial and then the resurrection being brought out of the water in new life. That's the focal point. So the new life is pictured by death? Think. Is it pictured by death? No. It's pictured by coming out of the water. The resurrection is the picture of the new life in Christ. The death is the, what pays the penalty for sin. The resurrection is always used in relationship to living that new spiritual life. So baptism is really identification. That's its significance. It means to uh, immerse something in something, so, something in, in some element, but it signifies identification. For example, in the ancient Greek army, when you got through boot camp, then the new hoplites, that was the new privates in the army, they would have a little graduation ceremony and there would be this pot or, or a bucket of pig's blood and they would take their uh, spear or their sword and they would plunge it or immerse it in the blood. It's identifying their weapon now. They are ready to go into combat. And so there's death involved, and so that's identification with blood. There were other ways in which the word was also used, but what we have in Scripture is that in all of the different baptisms, it's not talking about water. It's talking about identifying someone with something, a close connection. So we have eight different baptisms that are mentioned in the New Testament. The first three are <clears throat> ritual baptisms, okay, where the person gets wet. There's the baptism of Jesus, which is unique because he was the, the message of John the Baptist was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then if people repented or changed their mind about Jesus, about, I mean about God, about the kingdom, then they would be baptized. Jesus isn't repenting about anything. So his is a unique baptism that's indicating his identification with the plan of God as he began his physical, I mean, as he began his ministry, uh, public ministry, and, and during the incarnation. So that's described, his baptism is described in Matthew 3, 13 to 17. And then the baptism of John the Baptist is described in the previous verses in Matthew 3, 1 through 11. Then a third baptism that involves water is the baptism of believers. So when John baptized, he would take people down to the water, usually the Jordan River, and he would immerse them there. When Jesus went down to be baptized, he's immersed in water. When believers later on are baptized because they've trusted in Christ as their Savior, they too are immersed in water. It's a picture of cleansing, and in each case, it's the inauguration of something. It comes at the beginning. So you have these three ritual baptisms. They involve water, but and they all are involved with identification with something, Christ identification with the plan of God, uh, John the Baptist's identification with the message, with his message of the kingdom of God, and then the baptism of believers who are identified with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. Now, there are five more baptisms mentioned in Scripture. These are dry because the person who is being identified with something doesn't get wet. So you have the baptism of Noah that's described here in 1 Peter 3, 20 to 21. Everybody on the earth got wet and they drowned, but those who were on the ark believed the message of Noah and they're identified with Noah's message and so they go on into new life after the flood. Then there's the baptism of Moses. This is described in 1 Corinthians 10.2. It occurred when the Israelites went through, followed the pillar of fire and the cloud and obeyed Moses and walked on dry ground through the Red Sea. That's what, So they're identified with Moses' message. And when they come out the other side of the Red Sea, 
What are they? They are free. They're identified with Moses' gospel, and they are freed from the power of the slavery of Egypt. Then you have the baptism of fire. This talks about being identified with judgment. In Matthew 3, Jesus, uh, John the Baptist predicted that Jesus would do two things in the future. He would baptize by means of the Spirit and by means of fire. That's bringing judgment at the end of the tribulation period. Then there's the baptism of the cup. This is also uh, mentioned in Matthew. We've studied this. Jesus uh, talks about this as his cup. It pictures his judgment. The word is used Uh, In the Old Testament, the pouring out of God's cup of wrath indicates judgment. So he is judged for our sins on the cross. And then the last one is the baptism by means of the Holy Spirit. Now, of these eight baptisms, which one fits in 1 Peter 3.20? It's got to be the last one, the baptism by the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to show you why in just a minute. So these eight souls are saved through water, and that salvation has to do with not phase one, but phase two, progressive sanctification. They're freed from the power of sin. That's what that pictures there. And so in verse 21, when it says there's an antitype which now saves us, it delivers us spiritually in the midst of oppression and persecution, and Noah and his family were being ridiculed and oppressed and persecuted by all those people before the flood. So they were delivered, and the same way we are delivered, freed from the power of sin. Now, what the baptism of the Holy Spirit provides for us is that we believe in 2016. At that instant, we're identified retroactively going back to the cross, and we're identified with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. In Romans chapter 6, that is described as the power base for the Christian life. Never before in history were people freed from the power of the sin nature, but that's what's described in Romans 6, 3 through 5. So this antitype that now saves us, taking out all of the other in between, is something that comes through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's connected in Romans 6, 3 through 5. Let me read it. Paul says, Do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus, that's the baptism by the Holy Spirit, identification with Christ in his death. We, we, all of us who are baptized into Christ were baptized or identified into his death. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. So going into the water is a physical way of teaching about this spiritual reality that occurred at the instant of salvation when we're identified with Christ's death. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Christ's resurrection from the dead is the basis for our new life in him because it is that identification with Christ that frees us from the sin nature. That's the rest of Romans chapter 6. That power of the sin nature is gone. We are to, as Paul says in verse 12, we're to reckon ourselves or consider ourselves to be dead to sin. And in verse 5, this is what he says, if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Now listen to a couple of other things that, that are said in Scripture. In Philippians 3, 9 through 10, after Paul has talked about his justification by faith alone, he says, he prays that he would be found in Christ, not on the basis or not having his own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. It's that imputation of Christ's righteousness to us for the purpose of, 
That means that coming after that justification by faith, being saved from the penalty of sin, that I may know him in his spiritual life and the power of his resurrection. That should be our prayer, that we can know the power of Christ's resurrection, that resurrection power, that newness of life that is what distinguishes every church-age believer from what has gone on in the past. This is what makes us so radically different from all other believers in all of history, that we may know him and the power of his resurrection and what? The fellowship of his suffering. That's exactly what Peter's talking about, is that participation and fellowship of suffering, which is part of our spiritual life and spiritual growth. Peter introduced that back in verse 3, saying, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That living hope is our spiritual life. We live on the basis of that confident expectation of the future, which is why we can live a life in obedience to God today, why we, have the, we can have this clean conscience, because even when we sin, we confess sin and we're forgiven and cleansed of all unrighteousness. So that gives us this good conscience toward God. Now that phrase is used two other times in 1 Peter. It was used in 1 Peter 2.19. There it's talking about those who are unjustly suffering. Servants who are unjustly suffering with masters who are harsh, says, Servants, be submissive to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the harsh. For this is commendable. Again, it's commendable to suffer even unjustly. If because of conscience toward God, that is to keep your conscience clean, you don't give in to the sin nature and react in anger or bitterness or or revenge or rebellion or anything like that. If, because of conscience towards God, one endures grief, suffering wrongly. And then in 3.16, in that passage I began with, that we are to give everyone an answer for the hope that is in us with humility Because we have a good conscience. We haven't reacted in unjust circumstances with with sin, so we have a good conscience, and that is what gives the lie to the false accusations toward us. Then in verse 32, Peter wraps this up, and he, talking about Jesus Christ, says he's gone into heaven, and with that ascent, his triumph over death is complete, And he is uh, uh, promoted to the right hand of God, sitting on the Father's throne, and all angels and authorities of powers have been made subject to him. Now, in his deity, the deity of the second person of the Trinity, the deity of the Son of God, the angels were always submitted to his authority. They were always under his authority. But what's different is the person who is sitting at the right hand of God, the Father, is a human being. A human being is at the control center of the universe, and now all of the angels, because he has been uh, uh, raised above them, is submitted to a human being. This is why the the, the scripture says they're created a little lower than the angels, but then we are promoted above the angels because of Christ fulfilling that God's destiny for human beings. And all of that is wrapped up in these four verses in Peter. How do we deal with this unjust suffering? That's a problem everybody has. Whenever we're treated wrongly, we want to react. We want to defend ourselves. And what's the example? We saw it Sunday morning. We'll see it again this Sunday morning. Jesus stands in front of Pilate with the chief priests and all the false, uh, I mean, and all the religious leaders accusing him with all these false accusations, and Jesus doesn't say anything. Most of us are going, wait, 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 wait a minute. We didn't do that. Wait a minute. That's a lie. Jesus doesn't say a thing because he is 
perfectly just. He doesn't have to defend himself before the throne of God. He is the perfect God-man, and he is ready to go be that, that sacrifice. So when the question comes, how do we handle it? It's in that same way. It is we have to walk in obedience to the Lord. And as we grow and mature in handling difficult circumstances, then we become a, a, a testimony to God's grace and God's power. And we have a clean conscience before God as we become a not only a verbal witness to the gospel, but also a visible witness through our life. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for this opportunity to study and be reminded of these important principles and to understand how the death of Christ on the cross, how all of this just fits together in this total matrix of different events that go throughout the scripture. Everything fitting together, everything reinforcing one another to ultimately uh, bring glory to Jesus Christ, to honor him, to demonstrate who he is as the God-man, and ultimately to bring glory to you through the judgments that ultimately come at the end of time. And we pray that you would challenge us with this for the practical basis for these verses is to encourage us to uh, be humble, to be obedient to your word, not to react in situations where there are false accusations and to make sure that we have a clean conscience and that these that there are no false accusations and we pray this in Christ's name amen <laughs>